Today we have the privilege to interview Eugenie Scott, the Executive Director of the National Center for Science Education since 1987. Welcome to the Infidel. Thank you very much. What is the biggest threat to evolution at this time? In the United States, the biggest threat is the uh, emergence of this Academic Freedom Act strategy which is the most recent uh, incarnation of creationism, but it's so cleverly disguised, most people don't recognize it as a form of creationism. These are laws that are being introduced in many, many states around the country every year, uh, and they promote the idea that evolution and sometimes other subjects like global warming should be balanced in the classroom. And this, of course, sounds very good because we're all for critical thinking, we're all for free speech and balance and things like that. Academic freedom is the way that these things are, are, are uh, couched. But the evidence against evolution or the strengths and weaknesses of evolution that they're calling for, of course, can only be found in the creationist literature. So what you're really calling for is a backdoor teaching of creationism. And these bills are quite popular. Two of them have passed. And uh, we fear that in the future, more of them will be submitted, and unless people are very vigilant, uh, more of them will pass. Why is it so dangerous? It's dangerous because of a couple of things that can happen. Number one, it's just another example of making evolution controversial. So therefore, a lot of teachers will just pretty much throw up their hands and decide they're not going to bother teaching it. They don't want to put up with the flack. And the second thing that can happen is that uh, creationism in um, various forms is going to be introduced. Uh, either in the sense that there are many teachers who would like to teach creationism and will use these laws as an excuse to bring in the arguments of the Institute for Creation Research or Answers in Genesis or some of these other creationist organizations. And the third thing that can happen is that uh, teachers will be bringing in a lot of really bad science. Because, of course, the creationist anti-evolution arguments are, uh, on the surface, appearing to be scientific. Uh, some of them are scientific in the sense that they may not um, appeal to supernatural forces directly, but they present such long refuted and clearly untenable scientific ideas that no student's education is going to be improved by, by being taught wrong stuff. So there's a lot of reasons why we don't want, want these laws to be passed. Has there ever been a creationist paper published in a peer-reviewed publication? There, there are masked creationist papers in the sense that data will be published and uh, without any sort of implications for the uh, creationist conclusions that the author might hold. And then in creationist literature, you get the full thing. Um, there are papers presented at meetings, for example, by um, uh, members of the Institute for Creation Research on the distribution of nautiloid fossils, say, in Grand Canyon. Now, uh, it, they, these are just purely descriptive papers. But it's only in the creationist literature that the implication that these fossils have their particular orientation because they were laid down by Noah's flood is where you find these things. Um, there was one intelligent design paper that appeared in a peer-reviewed journal, uh, which had at the time a, an intelligent design sympathizer as the editor. And this is the um, uh, proceedings of the biological, sorry. PBSW, Proceedings of the Biological Society of Washington, in Washington, D.C., a very small journal, but, you know, basically full of descriptive articles about museum um, materials and so forth, for the most part, taxonomic and, and systematic uh, kinds of pieces. And um, uh, Steve Meyer of the, in, of the Discovery Institute published an article, uh, this was several years ago, in, uh, I think, 2004, in PBSW, and uh, when the article appeared, there were eyebrows raised all over the country when people got this journal in the mail. And because uh, the, the science was just so awful. And it was such a surprise that a, a real science journal like PPSW would, would uh, publish an article that, that was 
essentially not really relevant to the subject matter of the journal, number one, which mostly deals, as I say, with, with descriptive uh, uh, biology of museum um, collections, but also that uh, there was so much wrong stuff would be published. So it was clear that um, whoever reviewed whatever the whoever the peer reviewers were of this uh, journal, they were not people that had particular uh, expertise in the particular subject matter of, of Meyer's paper. So um, f um, in fairly short order, the uh, board of directors of the PBSW um, withdrew the paper. So I can't think of any um, peer-reviewed articles that have stood, so to speak, in uh, a, uh, yeah, sorry, I can't think of any creationist articles published in peer-reviewed journals that have stuck, shall we say. Mostly, I mean, and not, not because there's some big conspiracy against creationism, but just that the articles that are submitted um, don't measure up to the standards of, that are required for a, a peer-reviewed journal. Just, just as a little footnote on that, I don't know if you're interested, but a very long time ago, gosh, I'd have to look this article up, it was so long ago, but it was back in the early 80s, I think it was, um, a colleague of mine from the University of, of Kentucky and I published an, uh, an article which was a survey of journal editors. This was back, of course, before intelligent design at a time when traditional young earth creationism, creation science, was the, the issue at hand. And Henry Cole and I published an article where we gave the results of a survey that we had conducted of journal editors, asking them, first of all, if any articles on the following topics had been submitted. And they were all topics that were key to the uh, young earth creationist, creation science point of view. And, you know, had you received any articles on this topic? Um, had have you had you published any of them, um, and um, you know, basically trying to find out whether they're the answer to your question, and we got uh, an astonishingly high response rate. I think we got like ninety five or even maybe even hundred percent. I mean, the, the journal editors responded very very positively to this request for information, and uh, what we found is that. Basically, creationists were not submitting papers to peer-reviewed journals. Uh, it, you know, you got to play the game to score the points. If, if you're not even submitting papers, you can't argue that there is a conspiracy against you. Uh, one journal editor was rather interesting when, you know, because we had an open comment area for uh, on, on the questionnaire that we sent out, and one editor wrote back saying, if he got a paper a paper submitted to him, he'd publish it just to stir things up. So <laughs> I always thought that was kind of an interesting uh, uh, re reaction to this question of um, do creationists publish actual research? So creationists are not playing by the rules. As a, as a thing. Well, you know, they at the time that we wrote that article, uh, the creationists were doing a great deal of complaining about how there was this terrible conspiracy in mainstream science against them. But we found that they're not even submitting articles. So, you know, you, you, you can't complain about the rules of the game if you don't even try to play the game. In what states does creationism have its greatest hold in the education system? You know, the problem is there really aren't any good data on that. Um, the teaching of creationism, the advocating of creationism in public schools is unconstitutional. So a teacher is not about to uh, you know, report that she or he is bring, teaching creationism. What we do hear is, the, uh, is reports from teachers who uh, know about colleagues of theirs who are teaching creationism. And, you know, there's no way to get them to stop. Um, teachers are sort of reluctant to uh, um, confront one another. And so I'm sure it goes on a lot, but we don't really hear about it. Survey research shows that approximately 20 to 25 percent of practicing teachers would like to teach creationism. And uh, a smaller percentage than that admits to actually doing so. So it's not a very pleasant uh, thought. Where you tend to find, where, where, where we get the most reports, but as I say, we don't have any really solid data, so you know, take it for what it's worth, it's anecdotal. Where we get the most reports of this happening is predictably in the states where there is a very high percentage of the population that are 
um, conservative Christians, evangelicals, fundamentalists, charismatics, uh, etc. That particular spectrum of the of the Christian uh, faith, and uh, those are the states of the South and the Midwest primarily. But where we have over the years, where we found the most reports of creationism or problems teaching evolution, has tended to be in the suburbs and small towns. Uh, so we don't get that many complaints from from Atlanta but we would get more from outside of Atlanta in the suburbs and small towns. Um, we don't get that many complaints from Chicago, but we do get complaints from Illinois in the suburbs and small towns. So it's partly a demographic thing as much as it is a regional kind of thing. But wherever you have a fairly large concentration of religious conservatives, uh, and people of the conservative wing of, of the Christian faith, that is where you're likely to have the teaching of creationism. There aren't any states that allow the teaching of creationism, uh, and it is a it's it's a federal law. It's a constitutional issue. It's the establishment clause of the U.S. Constitution that has been um, uh, appealed to in the the many you know dozen or, or more cases having to do with the teaching of evolution and creationism. So it is not legal anywhere, and it is no more legal in any one state rather than another. Uh, the states do have. Um, uh, you know, freedom to, to do certain things, but they don't have the freedom to violate the Constitution. So there aren't any states where it legally would be easier to teach creationism. But certainly there are states where uh, the tendency may be stronger to just look the other way. And those would be those states where there is a fairly high percentage of citizens who are uh, conservative Christians. And that's the American South and the Midwest primarily. What are the various ways you're fighting climate change denial? We are at the beginning of our uh, effort to try to uh, improve the teaching of climate change. Uh, as we do with evolution, we help teachers or school boards or citizens who uh, want to have the good stuff taught and keep the bad stuff out. So we have uh, advised individual teachers who are receiving pushback from parents or community members as to where they can find the arguments to support the good science, and, and also some suggestions about how to how to how to um, present their arguments in ways that might be more effective to a climate change denier. Um, we have been certainly monitoring the legislation that's been cropping up uh, in the spring, January through about May, in in states around the country and helping citizens to fight back these academic freedom acts, which quite commonly bundle evolution and climate change uh, and, and encourage the teaching of very bad science along those ways. Um, we also have been uh, advising on and um, paying attention to the development of the next generation science standards, the NGSS as it's called, which is an effort of a group of 26 states and the National Academy of Sciences to come up with a set of standards that uh, a, a large number of states would adopt, which would help to um, uh, systematize the teaching of science a little bit better, rather than the, the, the fairly idiosyncratic system that we have, today, which where every state can uh, have its own set of standards. And for all of that, districts don't always uh, follow the state standards. So we really do have quite a patchwork of science education. The NGSS is an effort to try to uh, systematize that a little bit better so that um, states can cooperate and coordinate a little bit better than they have in the past. And the NGSS does include, particularly in middle school earth science, a fairly good um, a presentation, uh, or inclusion, I should say, a fairly good inclusion of climate change. It's not as extensive as we would like it, and they did leave out some pretty important concepts, but um, the, the beginning is there, and obviously we would encourage states that adopt the NGSS to uh, beef up the sections on climate change. So we're doing pretty much the same thing that we did with evolution. We're working grassroots, we're working with science associations and science teacher uh, associations to try to um, uh, improve the teaching and, and increase the teaching of climate change but particularly to help teachers and others deal with the attacks on uh, climate change that, that really are not scientific. 
Are you fighting climate change denial in courts? Right now, the, um, the mercifully, the legal situation is quiet. Um, trust me on this. The last thing you want to do is go to court. It's, it's, uh, it, sometimes it has to be done. But if it can be avoided, we certainly want to avoid it. So we, we are not trigger happy in the sense of, of wanting to join lots of lawsuits because it's, it's, it's exhausting, expensive, disruptive. There's a whole line of adjectives you can apply to it before you get to the, the, the good stuff. Uh, probably the next case is going to be on the Academic Freedom Act kinds of laws. And uh, who knows where that would be, of course. but. Um, we're not anxious to rush into that either. We, we would not want to um, support a suit on Academic Freedom Act kinds of laws unless it, uh, the, the fact situation of the particular incident was, was very favorable. Uh, nobody wants to make bad law in this regard. What can the public do to help? Hmm. What can the public do to help us? Well, clearly, join NCSC and support our efforts. We, we are a membership organization. You can join on our website, ncse.com. Uh, but also, uh, keep, keep your eyes open. Um, pay attention to what's going on in your local school district. Pay attention to the people who are running for those school board positions, because most of the people listening to this, uh, uh, your broadcast, are going to be voters, or they will soon be voters if they're um, teenagers. And uh, you have a role to play in making sure that the best people, uh, people who really want to improve science education, are going to be elected to your local and state board of education. So pay attention to who is running, pay attention to what their positions are, find out. Find out. Uh, there's a real tendency for people in the United States anyway to uh, not pay a lot of attention to those down ballot positions. You know, you pay attention to the, the the senator and the presidents and the governors, the important people at the top of the ballot. But by the time you trickle down to you know local city councilmen and school board members, it's you know, who do, who knows these people? Well, find out who these people are because it does make a very big difference. There's a tremendous amount of uh, authority and decision making that takes place at that local school board level and you want good people serving in those positions. The other thing is, and this is sort of part and parcel of, of uh, helping on CSE, um, pay attention and keep your ears open. If you hear of a teacher who's having trouble because of public pressure or parental pressure or sometimes even administrators, uh, who are le leaning on the teacher to either compromise the teaching of evolution or compromise the teaching of climate science, let us know. Because we are, it's very likely that we can help that teacher. And, and we are very good at working behind the scenes um, and not publicizing things and just trying to resolve problems before they get to be uh, uh, too big and too difficult and too public for them to, uh, for compromises to take place. So keep your ears open, join NCSC, and um, encourage, if you have children yourself or grandchildren or nieces and nephews, encourage them to enjoy science, take them to a museum, take them out, out to a hike in the country. Now, we need to kid, get kids out experiencing nature more if we're going to have a future generation of scientists. Why did you decide to retire this year? Well, yeah, there are personal reasons. Um, I've been doing this for a very long time. Uh, there are other things that I'm interested in doing. I have family responsibilities that I need to address. And this is a good time for me to pass the, the uh, baton or reins or whatever we're passing from one generation to another. Um, NCSC has this very exciting and new climate change initiative. We've got some new staff on board. Uh, we've got a uh, very energized staff with this important new project. We have uh, uh, a good solid board of directors uh, who are very much supportive of NCSC and our, our efforts. And uh, it's, it's a good time. It's a good time for somebody new to take over. And uh, so why wait? Uh, let's go for it. Thank you very much for your time, Ms. Scott, and good luck with all your future projects. 
Well, thank you very much. I, I keep reminding people that I'm retiring, not expiring. So I will, I will, you'll still have Jeannie Scott to kick around for a while. <laughs>